The countdown is on. Everything you need to get the edge at the end of the market day. This is The Close. Bets for a jumbo rate cut are back and conviction for a big stock market rotation returns. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. I feel like the market's like, let's go, rate cuts. By the way, happy Friday the 13th. Oh, happy Friday the 13th. It's going to be not a scary show. Okay, taking a look at where we are right now. You're looking at equal weighted index. I did this instead of the S&P just to show how we're broadening out in the rally. That's up 7 tenths of 1%. The outperformer, Russell 2000, up over 2%. You have the two-year yield down like a rock, down six basis points, and the dollar also lower. All of this points to that cut that we're going to see most likely on Wednesday. And the question is that 25 to 50 in that balance Balancing line there, Romain. Yeah, I was looking at the price action on the day and on the week, and really the biggest flip-flop in markets this week was really in that geeky corner of the overnight index swaps market. That's where traders this Friday are now pricing in a definitive quarter-point rate cut for the Fed's meeting next week and a roughly one-third chance of the FOMC cutting a half percentage points. That's a massive repricing from Monday when the market saw an almost near zero chance of a jumbo cut. But buyer, beware. This Fed tends to move slow. They're watching with a rearview mirror. But by November, it's going to be obvious that they should have cut. And, you know, they'll probably do 50 in November. And that is the backdrop for the flip-flop in equities with the S&P shaking off what was its worst week since March of 2023 and cruising today towards its best week since potentially November 2023. Rotation graphs on the Bloomberg terminal showing strong inflows into materials, industrials, real estate and healthcare stocks here. On this Friday the 13th, there are some notable laggards out there, though. Adobe crushed after saying recurring revenue in its creative software business was lower than Wall Street expectations. Moderna coming close to erasing all of its gains from the pandemic and Boeing down a fourth week as the embattled plane maker faces a drawn out labor strike that could further disrupt production and cash flow. We're going to get to those stories in a minute, but let's circle back here to the broader story and those Fed cuts. Yep, and that rotation trade. And there's one way to look at it, and you can look at it with the Russell and the two-year, right? So the more the two-year yield drops, the more we're pricing in some Fed cuts, either 25 or 50, you name it. Michael Faroli is still looking for 50 uh, next week. Now, the other way you look at it is the Russell, right? As you have lower yields and you have a, a Fed rate cut, you have a broadening out of this rally. And this just shows that relationship. So about a year ago, you started a big differential here. You have the Russell is the orange line and the two-year yield is the white line. They moved in tandem a little bit in the spring and now you see the big divergence. Look at this move that we've seen in the two-year yield just straight down like this just in the past couple months. The Russell's had a little bit of difficulty, however, but now we're really on the upside. So if we wind up seeing yields come down, if we see that Fed cut, does the broadening out from the Russell to what you were saying, Romain, right? Materials, even utilities, the best performing stock uh, on the day, does that all have legs? Absolutely. We've been here before, and that is the question of the day as we kick you off to the close here on this Friday afternoon. Yuri and Timmer, I'm pleased to say, joining us here in Studio 2, Director of Global Macro and at Fidelity Management and Research. Great to see you, Yuri. Good afternoon. All right, let's talk about this great rotation. We've had a couple of great rotations this year that didn't quite stick. This one does feel a bit different. Yeah, so it started in July, really, when we got that first sort of really good CPI report that finally put the market on notice that, okay, the Fed can actually execute on its bias to ease. And we've had this churn in the market, this big uh, broadening. Um, and, you know, overall, the statistics look pretty good, right? I mean, about 80% of stocks are in uptrends above their 200-day moving average. The S&P equal weighted index, uh, which you mentioned earlier, uh, is trading at an 18 multiple. Earnings are not only growing, they're accelerating, and the Fed is about to drop the cost of capital. So this is really the opportunity, um, barring a recession outcome, mm-hmm. that the market can truly broaden and the left behind stocks can can finally participate. You say barring a recession outcome. Not a lot of people are predicting recession, at least not imminently. Are you in one of those people? Um, so, so far, there's very little... Uh, at, at evidence or signs that a recession is imminent. Uh, we know about the SOM rule getting triggered, of course. Uh, but so far, the Fed's been able to thread the needle by reducing the excess labor demand, which of course can be inflationary, um, and not and, and by not producing a recession at the same time. Mm-hmm. So that obviously is the caveat. But the way I think about it, and we're, of course we're talking about the Fed, what they're going to do next week, um, even if the Fed were to deliver sort of a Greenspan-like uh, give back of some of the rate cuts as he did back in 1995, and we're in the soft landing mode, you figure a neutral 
policy rate is probably around three and a half, right? Two and a half, three percent inflation plus uh, a real rate spread, uh, the natural rate of interest. And that gives the Fed at least six, seven rate cuts. And then it's a question of how slowly or quickly does it want to deliver those rate cuts. And my sense is that if the Fed waited longer than it otherwise might have to deliver the rate cuts because they wanted to make sure that inflation really was well behaved, um, at this point, if they have 150 to 200 basis points to cut, why not just go with, with 50? So I think they're very much justified in doing 50, and they can easily explain it through, through that lens. Do we need 25 or 50 for the rotation into, say, utilities, material, industrials, and also into small caps to sustain, or does it not matter, just to start the cycle? I don't think it matters. I think, you know, at this point, with the emphasis going from the sticky inflation side of the Fed's mandate to the growth side, um, I think the, the market is seeing that the Fed has, like I said, at least six, seven rate cuts to go before even reaching neutral. That's not even assuming a full easing cycle, but just a normalization to neutral. And how quickly or slowly it gets there, I mean, it, it matters. Of course, you know, the housing market can really uh, take some of the pressure off if it goes quicker. But I don't think it really matters. What matters is that the left behind stocks, financials, industrials, mm -hmm. the bond proxies, real estate, utilities, um, can finally breathe. And that is you know, a, a, a promising sign for the broadening trade that we're seeing uh, unfold today. So does gold fit in to this narrative we've been talking about when it comes to equities? I can't count how many record highs we've had in gold. So I think gold is a play, and Bitcoin to some degree as well, is a play on, on the concept of fiscal dominance, right? So fiscal dominance means you have an expansionary fiscal policy, um, and the Fed sort of doesn't get in the way of that. If you think about fiscal dominance in its purest form, it's what Japan has done for years until very recently, and what the Fed actually did back in the 1940s. And so with the Fed now pivoting by presumably several hundred basis points at a time when the deficits are going to continue as far as the eye can see, that promises or implies that the money supply growth will be above trend in the future, and gold is very much a play on that. Is that mostly that demand? Is that mostly coming from outside the U.S.? The demand for gold. Uh, for I, I think it's it's a combination of you know the Russian central bank, the Chinese central yeah. bank, um, but I think it's probably global, and it, you know gold is a proven hedge against either price inflation or monetary inflation. It's also, of course, a play on the dollar. And now the dollar can weaken uh, because the interest rate differential between the U.S. and other central banks has narrowed. All right, Urian, great stuff. And great to see you in person. Urian Temer, Director of Global Macro at Fidelity Management and Research, kicking us off to the close here on this Friday afternoon as we push ahead to next week. And by the time we get to next week, we'll likely have an answer to the long-awaited question, how big will the Fed's first rate cut be? We dive into whether the jumbo rate cut bets on Wall Street are just a pipe dream. Plus, no driver, no worries. Uber expanding its partnership with Alphabet driverless tech company Waymo, what two cities could start seeing Uberless driver as soon as the next year. No thanks. And, <laughs> and we continue to follow that strike at Boeing. We're going to talk about why Moody's is warning that the situation puts the plane maker's credit rating at risk. That conversation and so much more coming up in a bit. This is The Close on Bloomberg. strike will impact production and deliveries and operations and will jeopardize our recovery. So our immediate focus is to be laser-like focused on actions to conserve cash, and we will. That was Boeing's CFO discussing how the current labor strike will impact its production. This comes as Moody's issues a warning that the aerospace giant is at risk of losing its investment grade credit rating. Shares of Boeing are sliding right now by about 3.2 percent. As the company says, it is willing to get back to negotiating table immediately. I want to bring in now Ben Chicanos, uh, aerospace director and S&P Global Ratings. Hey, Ben, uh, how long do you think until we reach a deal? Yeah, I, it's not clear at this point to me uh, what the what the, uh, the the difference or what the what the key sticking point is. I think probably if it's if it's uh, wages, there's probably a little more. Uh, it'll probably be a, a quicker 
uh, quicker deal reached. Um, if it's you know if it's if it's other other points, I think it could take longer. Um, so I, at this point, we're thinking a short short uh, short strike in the in, in the order of weeks. Um, but you know, we, we we at this point, we we just don't know. What do the mechanics? Uh, want. I mean, the labor, yes, but in terms of planes being built specifically on the West Coast by unions, for example, where are those sticking points? Yeah, but my understanding was that the the, uh, the offer included uh, the next uh, plane to be built in the uh, in the Puget Sound area. So, I, I my understanding is that that is uh, that's already been you know was part of the uh, the initial offer. So let's get this to a point here. When we talk about uh, the, this company, which we know is already dealing with its own issues with regards to uh, its 777 and uh, broader concerns about leadership here, when you start to see uh, some of the rating agencies taking a closer look here, do you think we are in a position where when you look at cash flow, you look at profitability and the potential impact, how much longer does this strike have to go on when we have to really start to talk about a potential rating downgrade? Yeah, well, the, I think that there are uh, there are things that a company can can do. I, I think you, you heard uh, Brian West comment uh, comments earlier today that, that potentially that they could they could uh, raise capital and, and that would that would certainly uh, that would certainly uh, give them some cushion, buy them some time. Um, so, I mean, I think a combination of, of a of a quick resolution and and, and potential um, additional capital would would certainly. Um, w- would certainly improve the situation from a from a rating standpoint. Are you su- um, are you surprised though that it got to this point here? I mean, we came out of a summer last year uh, where we had seen a lot of strikes in other industries. We had seen the the bargaining power, uh, at least in this cycle, that the unions had and the concessions that companies had to make. Boeing had a chance to sort of nip this in the bud. This is a long term contract. Yeah, 40% sounds like a lot. Why don't you think that they were maybe a little bit more willing to go closer towards that number simply to get this off of the books? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think that there was, they may have misread the, the level of, of, uh, of, uh, of, un, of dissatisfaction. Um, certainly the, the union leadership may, may also have, have misread it. Um, it's also possible that this gives them the, the opportunity to they uh, took a uh, the, the first offer they have room to 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 go uh, room to go up uh, from there uh, to show that they've they they got a better deal um, but you know that that's I'm looking at uh, the spirit situation last summer um, there was a, a similar uh, initial offer rejected and and came back with a with a mm-hmm. with a improved uh, counter offer and there was a, 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 a quite short uh, strike. Um, you know that that's kind of the best case scenario from our perspective, and no, not not a, not a guarantee that that's how it's going to play out. But that's that's one way it could go. Oh, how long do you think the stock is going to suffer for? Like, what, like what's going to be a floor for this if this goes on for a few weeks, like you said? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not going to speculate on the stock. I mean, certainly the, the longer it goes on, the more cash uh, they burn. Um, and they were already uh, guiding towards a pretty sizable cash burn for the year. Um, and every every day that, it, that a strike uh, goes goes on, I think that the deeper that, that hole gets. All right, Ben, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Ben Chocanos, uh, Aerospace Director and S&P Global Ratings. Man, it's not going to be an easy time. Yeah, absolutely. Labor issues now for Boeing and, of course, keeping an eye on potential labor uh, issues at some of the East Coast and Gulf Coast ports here in the United States. But some breaking news just crossing the wire. This on your favorite person, Alex Steele. Sam Bankman-Fried uh, formally filing an appeal to overturn his fraud conviction. This crossing the wire right now. The New York Times reporting uh, that he has now filed that appeal uh, to effectively overturn his fraud conviction. Remember, he is serving a 25-year sentence in prison uh, related to the collapse of his cryptocurrency firm, FTX. Apparently, uh, his lawyer is saying that uh, Sam Bankman-Fried was never presumed innocent. He was presumed guilty by the judge who presided over his trial. It's all about the lawyers. That's the deal. Yeah, 102-page page appeal Ooh. calling for a new trial, pointing to several rulings by the judge that limited the ability for him to introduce new evidence in the case. We'll get some more details on that and bring you bring it to you as soon as we get them. In the meantime, we want to take a deeper dive into Carvana's business model. Our top call segment is coming up next, and we're going to talk to the analyst saying that it could Carvana could become the next U.S. retail 
category killer. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side, our top calls. These are the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off today with Arm Holdings. Raymond James initiating coverage on the chip design company with an outperform recommendation, $160 price target, implying an upside of about 8%. The analyst saying Arm is well positioned to benefit from rapid growth of Gen AI in the cloud. He also expects Arm to dish out more chips for the smartphone, car, data center, and PC markets. Shares are armed, getting a nice bid on the day, up about 6%. Moderna, next in line. The vaccine company having an ill day as analysts tuck tail. JP Morgan among them, downgrading the stock to underweight. The analyst saying she's not a fan of Moderna's plan to cut costs rather than raise equity, making it difficult for the stock to keep up with its peers. Those shares, which plunged yesterday, down another 3% today. And finally, let's take a look at Capri Holdings, owner of the Michael Coors and Jimmy Choo fashion brand, City downgrading to neutral from buy. This as the FTC here in the U.S. furthers its case to challenge Capri's merger with Tapestry. While the analyst believes the FTC's case is, quote, without merit, he does feel that the decision will ultimately have an adverse impact on valuation. Capri shares down 3% on the day. And those are some of our top calls. Now, we do want to return to a call from earlier this week on Carvana. That's the used car dealership service. Stevens rating it overweight and praising Carvana's business model and profitability. Joining us for more is the man behind that call, Jeff Flick. He's managing director and research analyst covering the auto ecosystem now over at Stevens. Great to see you again here, Jeff. And let's get right to it. I mean, this is obviously a big comeback story. I always tell people if you want to know what the best performing stock is, it's not NVIDIA, it's Carvana. But it's coming off an incredibly low base, Jeff. And I am curious as to what gives you the conviction that there's more to this stock right now than just bouncing off those lows. Well, first off, um, Romain, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You know, interestingly enough, the used car uh, market this year is actually down 1% to 2% in terms of units. Carvana was up 16% in Q1 and 32% in Q2. So in, in addition, uh, the average profitability of a used car sale at, um, this year is down, whereas Carvana's has gone up in there. As we point out in the note, it is, is um, the highest uh, metric uh, yeah. in the industry at uh, $3,400. What, what's driving that disparity? Why, why are people going to Carvana to buy their used cars instead of others? Well, it's a combination of the demand and supply side of the equation. From the um, you know, demand side of the equation, why people are going is it's simply a better experience. Uh, you know, the other thing is, you know, the, you know, the, the old adage in the uh, car business is, you know, consumers don't buy a car, they buy a monthly payment. And Carvana's average monthly payment is about four hundred and seventy five dollars. So it's not necessarily the you know Mercedes and BMW crowd. But, you know, Carvana, as we point out, a note is selling to the masses, uh, you know, from the supply side. You know, we point out Carvana's taken an approach similar to like what McDonald's did in the 50s and 60s. They've standardized the reconditioning process of a used car. I mean, people take for granted when you buy a used car, you know, it, it didn't quite look that way. When you bought it, you know, there's got to be a fair amount of reconditioning that gets done. And so Carvana has actually centralized that process. And they probably have about a $500 to $1,000 per unit advantage over their competition. Wow. Wow, that's quite a bit. So I'm guessing there is definitely a first mover advantage, obviously, for Carvana. Do they have any real competition in that area? Well, that's the interesting thing about the uh, you know used car market. First off, it is the largest uh, consumer vertical in the U.S. at uh, a tr over a trillion dollars. It's about 40 million units are sold a year. CarMax is the leading um, player, but they only have 2% market share. Carvana has one. The top 12 uh, participants only make up 7% of the market. So there's not an awful lot of competition. Carvana is really competing against what we call in the note, you know, Bob's used car lot. Hmm. So, Jeff, are there more inefficiencies then that they get to ring out or have they kind of maximized that kind of potential and it's now incumbent on the regular used car guys to kind of catch up? No, I, I, well, we think that, look, they're just getting going in a lot of areas on the reconditioning side. You know, there's a lot of economies of learning. It's very much like an assembly plant. You know, we think there's probably another 500 to $1,000 uh, there. You know, likely they'll give a good portion of that to the consumer 
uh, advertising per unit. They, you know, Carvana pays about five hundred and fifty dollars per unit of advertising. You know, the average used car person uh, uh, dealer might spend three hundred. Uh, you know, Carvana has chosen to advertise to that level. So I think there's more to go, and you know, frankly, there there's really no one that can catch them. Well, well, I'm glad you bring that up because, I mean, there are a lot of competitors out there. Obviously, you, you have uh, you know, AutoNation and some of the other ones. Maybe they don't necessarily have the same standardization that Carvana has. But is there any sense here that they could try to play catch up and more meaningfully that they could do it? I mean, there, it's not like they don't have the deep pockets. Well, one of the things you got to understand is, you know, AutoNation and, you know, for example, maybe uh, – uh, Penske Automotive, they focus more on the two to four year old, what you'd kind of call the certified pre owned car. Carvana, the average car on a Carvana site is 5.6 years old. So, again, it's really catering to the masses. Um, it's not that AutoNation couldn't choose to go over that, but uh, go for that market. But, um, you know, Carvana's already there and it's it's a slightly different market. You know, AutoNation gets a lot of its supply from trade ins. And again, those are the two to four year old cars. All right, Jeff, uh, great to talk to you and really interesting research note here, of course, on one of the hottest stocks out there uh, making the fundamental case for Carvana. Jeff Lick over at Stevens, uh, those shares, a modest bit here on the day, but I was looking at it, it's up, you know, 160 something percent on a year to date basis off an incredible low sure. for the company. But still on a percentage basis, if you time this right, you're doing well. I also wonder, too, on a macro level, and I don't actually have the answer to this, if we get more broad based tariffs mm -hmm. on foreign imports of cars, does that help these kind of you know, secondhand retailers, basically. And mm. would that be even a bigger boost for Carvana because the selling prices would be higher? Like, I'm wondering how the macro kind of overlays into this. Yeah. And then there's the interest rate uh, equation yes. of it, too. And I don't know how that's going to reshape the car market. Once you see interest rates, does that push people more to new cars or are they still going to sort of be interested in used cars? What well, was Ally Financial that we saw this week? Yeah. They said that auto loans were really struggling. So, yeah. yeah. So wouldn't that then, in essence, yeah. push them into even cheaper used cars? Yeah. Uh, if they had so a lot, of, lot of layers in this. I mean, I just recently bought a car. I mean, we bought new, a brand new car. Yeah. Uh, and it was an interesting experience here. And I think, but we did look at Carvana and some of these sort of kind of online sellers, if you will. And, and you know, there was an ease to it, uh, you know, if you wanted to go that route that you weren't going to get if you just walked to a lot out in New Jersey, New York, or wherever. And you get a bigger so, range. Yeah. Like you get a bigger range of different mm -hmm. items, which is why I yeah. wonder if we get like less uh, EVs or different imports of cars that aren't able to come in or higher tariffs, if that also helps because you yeah. have a broader uh, lens there. All right, coming up, aware, aware, will Fed rates go? <laughs> Thank you for that tease, oh, guys. Oh, Romeo. Thank you. Uh, we're going to wrap up this week's Ecodata and look ahead to the next week's rate decision with former Fed Governor uh, Randall Krosner will be joining us. Uh, also, how do you know where neutral real is? I don't understand how you figure that out right now as an economist. We'll break that down with him. This is The Close on Bloomberg. I think the logic for 50 is pretty compelling. Uh, the Fed, Fed officials have basically said policy should be neutral. The risks to the uh, labor market side are equal to the risks on the inflation side, and they're a long way from neutral. All right, former New York Fed Pres Bill Dudley uh, speaking just about one week ago right here on this show discussing what he expects from the Federal Reserve next week here. And we are in countdown mode, just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. The countdown to the close and the countdown, of course, to a big Fed decision, Alex. Yeah, and also taking a look at what Bill Dudley said overnight at a conference in Asia, he's like, look, there's a strong case for 50. Yeah. And he's not the only one. Michael Forley sticking to his 50 call. City sees 25 now uh, next week, but then they see two more fit, two 50s in November and December. And you see that it reflected in Treasury prices, that yield curve shifting lower, and then, of course, uh, in the options markets. Uh, where everyone, those overnight index swaps, really indicating, I think right now, last time I checked, roughly about a 36, 37 percent chance we get that jumbo rate cut. Right. It definitely feels like we're on the line here. Yeah. So for more on this, let's go to Randall Krosner, professor of economics at the Booth School of Business and a former governor for the Federal Reserve System. Hey, Randy, my question is, how close do you think it's going to be between 50 and 25? Well, it's definitely a close call. I think the markets have it right this time. Often the markets don't seem to get it right and anticipate uh, some wild moves by the Fed. But here I think they really have a real debate internally of um, what they should do at the first step. You can look to the inflation numbers and say, hey, core um, PCE, which is their favorite measure, you know, that's been stubbornly staying above 2.5% for the last three or four months. So we, we better move carefully. Um, on the other side, you say, 
looks like labor market is uh, weakening a little bit more rapidly than we would like. Um, and with long and variable lags monetary policy, we better get going. So I think that's going to be the debate around the table. Yeah, I love that you brought up the long and variable lags. We obviously had them on the hiking cycle. Do we also get them on the cutting cycle? For sure. And, um, and that's one of the challenges that some people would say, well, it's too late. Um, the uh, you know, sub- substantial slowdown is baked into the cake. And I do think that there will be a substantial slowdown in the rest of the year, not necessarily uh, not necessarily recession, um, but a substantial slowdown because, you know, as, as the Fed has kept the interest rate constant, inflation has come down. And so the, the inflation adjusted interest rate, that is the real interest rate, has gone up substantially over the last year. So it gets to a question, though, uh, Randy. So when we do get this rate cut, whatever it may be, uh, next Wednesday, Powell's still got to come out there and answer some questions. And I'm sure everyone's going to ask about the pace of future rate hikes and, and I guess, the steepness of those hikes uh, in the short term here. How much, I guess, how much of, of his hand does Powell need to show or will show next Wednesday about the future rate hikes beyond September 18th? I think that's really what the markets are going to react to uh, because, you know, they're right on the edge between 25 and 50, but it's what's coming in the rest of the year. And uh, we'll have the uh, uh, the economic projections, so we'll get some new information from the uh, uh, his colleagues and himself about uh, where things are going to be going. And, um, and so that's really what the market's going to react to. His challenge is that if he goes 50 now, it's going to be really difficult to say, well, maybe we'll just do 25 at one of the next two meetings. So he's kind of committing to 150. And does he really want to do that? Maybe. Um, But I'm not sure he's completely there. This gets to this also issue, too, that we're heading into this rate easing cycle at a time where everybody is hyper focused right now on fiscal conditions, particularly given a big election and maybe some potential big policy changes over the next few years that could maybe exacerbate that fiscal situation. You spent some time on the Council of Economic Advisors, had the president's ear here. I mean, what's sort of the conversation that the Fed has to have amongst themselves with regards to fiscal policy that they effectively have no control over? Sure, that's one of the things that the um, uh, Fed has to deal with. There are a lot of things outside the Fed's control. People think the Fed controls everything, but it really doesn't. And fiscal policy is one of those key things that it doesn't control. And so it has to make some estimates. It'll probably do some uh, alternative simulations of the model. We used to call them alt sims uh, to look at, well, you know, what if um, uh, we get this one um, uh, one approach to fiscal policy? What if we get another approach to fiscal policy? I think. Uh, yeah, under regardless of who the next uh, president is, I think we'll continue to have a fair amount of spending and a fair amount of and fairly high deficits. Uh, one may be you know, maybe larger uh, mm-hmm. or smaller under one president or the other, but I think they're assuming that there's going to be a fair amount of uh, fiscal uh, impetus in the economy going forward. So, Randy, does that mean that growth's going to reaccelerate? Like, if we get the soft landing and we get the fiscal spend, no matter who's in the White House, do we have growth reaccelerating and maybe inflation reaccelerating? That's exactly what they have to uh, to worry about. And, you know, growth has been reasonably good. The um, the unemployment rate has stayed remarkably low. I mean, people are rending garments over it being the low fours. But my goodness, low fours is a really, really good number. It's just we've been in the unusual situation of a near 50-year low for the last uh, for the last year. Uh, I think it's likely that we could that we could get a five handle on uh, on the unemployment rate over the next uh, six months or so. But it still wouldn't necessarily mean recession. Uh, that's just um, a slowdown, which I think would help to uh, reduce the um, uh, the inflationary pressures. Uh, but we'll have to see. I mean, 5% sounds bad. I know historically that, that that's like nothing. But compared to where we were, that would be kind of aggressive. Yeah, I think uh, because I do think the economy will slow. As I mentioned, I, I think there's been a lot of so-called real tightening as uh, inflation has come down, but interest rates, the, the Fed's interest rates stay constant. The real cost of borrowing has gone up. Also, something that's great for American households is that real wages have started to grow over the last year. But what that also means is that means that um, uh, firms are going to be a little less uh, uh, sanguine about uh, about hiring people than they have before. And so I think that combination of things, plus you know, the old fiscal stimulus that came in to really boost people's savings, we're not you know they've kind of spent a lot of that down. So I think there's going to be uh, be more challenges going forward. How much do, then does does a, a rate cut or multiple rate cuts? actually goose the economy. I mean, let's say we get that 100 basis points over the next few months as the market thinks we're going to get. Do you think that will have an immediate and direct impact? 
Uh, it'll have uh, it'll certainly have some impact on uh, uh, some asset valuations. Obviously, the stock market seems to like uh, lower uh, lower interest rates, and uh, a lot of private equity valuations would would probably go up. Um, on the real economy, in terms of um, uh, housing market and spending and uh, investment, it'll take a little bit more time. That's where the uh, the long and variable lags come in. So, a little bit on asset prices, and then a longer uh, longer tail effect on the uh, the real economy. All right, Randy, really appreciate you hopping on for us. I know you're a busy guy. Randy Krosner there, a former Fed governor and now professor of economics at the Booth School of Business, setting us up here for the Fed's two-day meeting, September 17th and 18th. It seems like it's a foregone conclusion. We're getting a cut, right? Right. The question is, how big? And also, do markets react now to the downside if we don't get 50 basis points? That's what I wonder. Are we just are we on the hopium phase once again here? But this is what we do in financial media. We <laughs> yeah. talk about something so much, and then it happens, and then nothing actually happens in the market. But now that we're sort of more the knife's edge, yeah. do we get a market reaction to the downside? I thought some of his comments, though, about economic conditions, particularly when it comes to the unemployment rate, that's kind of interesting, too, though. I, mm -hmm. I know 5%, like you said, maybe that's not huge, but given where we used to be when we're at 4 2 now to get to 5 in what, what did he say, six months or something? Or at least the next year, like yeah. how you get there and what that actually winds up looking like. It's interesting, though, if we go to three, if we have a three handle uh, for the neutral rate, what, is, what does that mean we have the next cycle? Like, do we go to 7% then? Do we get to 8 Like, does it get really bad later? Am I, am I, am you're, I, you're getting I'm, way ahead of us, I'm part Irish. Wait. That's what we do. <laughs> All right. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about what the Fed's going to do in 2029. <laughs> but before yeah, exactly. we do that, <laughs> we're going to talk about Uber. <laughs> uh, Uber actually having a good day. Lyft, not so much here. The driverless future? Well, it may be upon us. Uber stock rising on the news that it's expanding its partnership with one driverless tech company. It's our stock of the hour, and it's up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, time now for our stock of the hour. A closer look at Uber having a great day as we learned that the company is indeed going driverless here. There was an announcement that it will be the sole app offering driverless rides using, wait for it, Waymo. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now to talk a little bit more uh, about uh, what's going on here. Okay, so Waymo, of course, is known by Alphabet. We talk about uh, this is going to be very limited here. They're basically saying Austin, Texas, and Atlanta. I'm, I wasn't quite sure the time frame of when they start doing this, but I mean, what's the net benefit? I guess it's good that they've somehow locked in Waymo, which most yes. people think is kind of the premier driverless car company out there right now. But what's what's the upside for Uber? I think that the biggest upside is that they were previously planning on being in autonomous vehicles themselves actually having the vehicles. They scrapped that plan in the pandemic, uh -huh. but it's an area they needed to address. So now they have this partnership. The partnership began last year, but now we have this exclusive deal for them to basically manage uh, the uh, Way Waymo Porsche, no, excuse me, Jaguar, Jaguar. iPath. Yeah, EVs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, iPace. I pace. Okay, I pace. I pace yeah. Thank you. Uh, in both Atlanta, Georgia, and Austin, Texas. Now, what, yeah. there's so many different interesting things that we could take this. So it starts next year. Okay. Um, but what's also very interesting is Austin, Texas. Of course, Elon Musk. Next month, he will be uh, doing the Robo Taxi event. So this is almost like a little bit preemptive. But when uh, you compare gotcha. okay. Waymo to what Tesla's Robo Taxi potential is going to be, Waymo is like maybe five or ten thousand vehicles a day, rides a day. Tesla has the ability to be so much bigger. So, but, yeah. you know, Waymo and Uber are really behind the curve. I think that's something around this. The stocks are clearly having a, a big reaction because this is something they, again, do need to address. They need to be in the AV spe space. But we don't know the unit economics. We don't know what this is going to do to profitability. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of unknowns. It's a step in the right I, direction, mm -hmm. but it might be a smaller step than the stocks suggest. Hmm. Romain, yes? Um, but, but, but I'm still <laughs> confused. So, so to get permission to just take this on the roads, right? And I could pick that because I feel like I saw this in like total recall and it didn't end oh, yeah, well. It did so, not end well. So is it I just call up one of these things and I can choose between Uber regular, Uber black oh. or Uber uh, driverless. Whatever. Take me to yes. Well, I was under the impression yeah. that it could just show up without you requesting it. But maybe I'm wrong on that point. Yeah, that but, sounds a little aggressive. I, I swear. But, I'm trying but, to find it right now. Anyway, but it looks but the take rate for uh, Uber is still 30 percent, which is what it gets normally. But 
I was talking to Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence earlier also, and he was saying that the difference is, is that Uber is going to service the cars, yes. take care Clean of the them, cars, repair them. them, the cars. So, yes. so the cost is on, is on Uber. They're almost like a management own. company for a building in a way. But again, we don't know what the Which economics are. they don't have are. to do for a regular Uber car. So that's going to definitely wind up uh, yes. dinging that and economics. He, and I had a great conversation with Mandeep also off air. I believe yours was on radio where he was saying that they have freight that's unprofitable, delivery is unprofitable. From his perspective, they should get rid of those other businesses. They need to be an AV, but they really need to be focused on it so that it doesn't drag on profitability. He was not convinced. On the other hand, Mark Mahaney over at Evercore ISI, he's saying that this is a key catalyst, addresses the overhang. So it seems as though there's different. Yeah. different so so would, would, are, would you get in one of those I was things? just about to ask you. You beat me no. to the punch. Oh, gosh, no. Are you kidding me? You yeah. would. But would yeah. you have gone to a car with a stranger like 10 years exactly. ago? Exactly. No. So, so I would definitely, no. <laughs> I would prefer to get in an AV as yeah. opposed to a car with a stranger. But like you're not frankly. sitting in the front seat. Like yeah, what if something happens? The like, I don't know. Isn't the whole point yeah. of when you yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, nobody ever gets injured in the back seat. <laughs> right. No, but nobody, I mean, like, don't you want to be in the front? Like just in case. The safest seat, by the way, is behind the driver. Just so that really? we're talking about this, yes, that's the safest seat in the car. Use them as a shield. <laughs> Abigail Doolittle, very tactical. <laughs> tactical driver sit position there. All right, uh, taking a look at Uber stock, uh, definitely up on the day. All right, we are 15 minutes away from the closing bell. Uh, we're going to break down the last-minute market action with Joanne Feeney, partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capitals Management. This is Bloomberg. The, the market is seeing that the Fed has, like I said, at least six, seven rate cuts to go before even reaching neutral. That's not even assuming a full easing cycle, but just a normalization to neutral. And how quickly or slowly it gets there, I mean, it, it matters. All right, that was Urian Timmer, Director of Global Macro at Fidelity, kicking us off to the close just about 10 minutes ago, talking about what else. Everybody looking ahead to the big Fed meeting and whether all of these rate cut bets that are being priced in today are actually going to be good money spent. But you are seeing the rotation in the yeah. equity market, so it appears to be continuing on that theme, right? The S&P is up half a percent, but if you look beyond that, the Russell is up a whopping 2.3 percent. In the S&P, utilities are the best performing sector, up over 1 percent, right? I mean, yeah, you got Adobe down, some of the tech names are down, but on the whole, it's very much of a rotation trade. Absolutely here, and as you get closer to those closing bells, and I guess closer to that Fed meeting, let's get some insights out of our next guest. Joanne Feeney joining us right now, partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management. And of course, Joanne, we start off with the question of the day and really of the week, and that really is, are you anticipating that we are going to get that outsized rate cut, 50 basis points, next Wednesday? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the pundits certainly are throwing that uh, possibility around, and obviously a lot of coverage of that. We, we are in a situation where the bet is a more dispersed one than we have seen in previous, uh, in the up, up to previous Fed meetings. So our view at Advisors Capital is that it's more likely that we get a 25 basis point rate cut. We don't see the need for the Fed to do anything dramatic here. It's clearly the case that the economy is slowing down. It's clearly the case that inflation has come down. So things are working, right? The Fed rate increases over the past year and a half or so have done their job. Uh, we are in a position, we think, for rates to, to now come down, but we don't see necessarily a reason for them to do anything dramatic because yeah. of the signaling question and the credibility question. Now, they don't want to potentially alarm folks and, and have people think, oh no, what does the Fed see yeah. in, in risks to the economy that we don't? Well, that gets to the question then, too. When we talk about this rotation, we're looking at pretty massive outperformance, at least today, for the Russell and the mid-caps relative to the broader market here. How much do these rate cuts, this sort of easing cycle in totality, matter to the sustainability of that rotation? Yeah, yeah Romain, I think what you're seeing today, right, is that uh, that bet, that a 40 percent chance of a 50 basis point cut is coming into equities. Obviously, smaller cap companies are more helped by rates coming down. Big cost of their capital is in short-term borrowing. So you can see why you're seeing that rotation. And we do worry, and we have warned clients that there's likely to be some volatility here in the near term as the reality sinks in uh, in either direction. So yeah, I don't think that the rotation, uh, this short-term rotation that we've seen is necessarily sustainable, especially if we're right and we only get a 25 basis point uh, cut next week. I mean, it sets me up. I was wondering if we don't get that 50 basis points, like what does the market do? Like, do you see a ton of selling on the front end? Do you see a sell-off in small caps and the cyclicals? 
Yeah, there's a chance of that. And that's why, you know, from our perspective for clients, right, what we want to do is make sure we've built portfolios that are more resilient, uh, that are more middle of the road. Um, we certainly have some small mid cap portfolio strategies that are going to be jerked around by this. Um, but overall, in our larger strategies, like our balance strategy, we want to take the position that for the long term, we know that rates are going to come down. So mm -hmm. even if it doesn't all happen next week, right, we know eventually the Fed's going to be instituting multiple rate cuts. And over time, that's going to reduce the cost of capital for firms. It's going to reduce the cost of capital for consumers. And the consumer is already in a pretty good place. So we think that extends the reasonable growth that we're seeing in the U.S. economy. And ultimately, the conversation should turn back yeah. to fundamentals I mean of earnings. Right. I mean, not if you're a dollar store, maybe. You still have that K-shaped economy when it comes to the consumer. So where in the consumer sector, what kind of stocks do you think do, does have, do have more legroom? Yeah, Alex. So we, we, we do agree with that, if you like, K-shaped situation for consumers. That is, the low end, the mid-range consumer really have been pressured by inflation, uh, by the increase in the level of prices over the last few years, clearly constraining their budgets. And they're shopping at various places. We like Places like TJ Maxx, Marshalls, so we own TJX, um, we like McDonald's. We like to own uh, companies where consumers are going to run to when their budgets get stressed, when things are a little bit tighter. At the high end, though, we're still seeing a fair bit of strength. We like Williams-Sonoma, sort of affordable luxury, and that's uh, continued you know, to have some bumps yeah. in the road. But ultimately, we think that's well positioned for the growth in folks moving back into their own houses as that market starts to loosen up a little bit more. Yeah, and we have, it's interesting too, we had those RH earnings the other day, which surprised a lot of folks. Uh, you have some strength here in certain pockets of that yeah. market. I do want to go back to something you just said about the idea of running to uh, uh, the sort of retailers that I guess potentially benefit from a slowing economy here. That hasn't been as easy as, as I think some people thought. I mean, we saw kind of the dollar stores, and I know that's kind of an idiosyncratic story, but we saw them not really sort of benefit, at least based on the earnings that we saw out of them. So how are you sort of picking and choosing where people are going to go? Because it's not necessarily going to be the same places that maybe in past cycles people went. Yeah, interesting. So compare something like the dollar stores to a TJX. So the dollar stores are always shopped by the low-end consumer. And so as they struggle more with their budgets, they have to spend less, right? They have to economize more. So those stores are likely to suffer. Uh, whereas a TJ Maxx and Marshalls, that line up of companies, uh, Ross stores, et cetera, they tend to pick up shoppers from the upper middle class who come down, say, to a TJ Maxx to look for bargains as their budgets get tighter. So those stores actually see an increase in traffic when the economy gets a little bit tougher for the consumer. Target is another one. You know, it's a affordable but it's also a place to go buy, uh, find bargains. And so we yeah. think the middle class, upper middle class chop more at those places, and so they do better. Yeah, interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way, uh, which is why we have you on, Joanne. Another <laughs> uh, sort of uh, recommendation that I saw you guys had or holdings that you have were in uh, the defense sector. And I know there's been a lot of talk about geopolitics and the wars going on here. Is that a play on that? Yeah, you know, we think it's wise in, in something like a balanced strategy where we're trying to make it more conservative to put in stocks that will do well if the world really runs into greater geopolitical problems, uh, whether it's a further exacerbation of troubles in Europe, in the Middle East, or in Southeast Asia. And so owning companies like Raytheon or Lockheed Martin, or even a small, smaller company like Kratos, which makes yeah. drones, uh, in our growth strategy, we find uh, not only useful for the inevitable, what we see as inevitable growth of defense spending across the world, but also as a play to uh, create more defensiveness in a portfolio. All right, Joanne, got to leave it there. Have a wonderful weekend. Joanne Feeney, she's partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management, helping us count down to these closing bells. Alex, just about uh, three and a half minutes to go here. And stocks, five straight days, five straight days of gains. Yep. Does it mm -hmm. last when it comes to next week? Next week? Like, mm -hmm. what kind of rhetoric might we hear um, uh, that will sort of keep that 25 to 50 kind of on the line? And if mm -hmm. we don't get that 50, what happens? Absolutely here. The market already positioning around that big Fed meeting. Of course, we will have full coverage of that next week. In the meantime, right here on this Friday, we have full coverage of all of the market action on the day and on the week. That coverage, it starts right now. The Closing Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now.
And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic and Alex Steele taking you to the closing bell, a global simulcast. It starts right now. Scarlett Fu in the TV studio. Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic in the radio booth. Welcome to our audiences across all of our platforms, including our partnership with YouTube. Fifth day of the week, Carol Masser. You won't hear for all five of them, but five straight days of gains. Felt like six. Thank you very much. I'm not going to say why. Uh, anyway, having said that, I'm going to give you a gift because you love talking about the small caps. And that expectation or talk certainly today about maybe the Fed being a little bit more aggressive with a rate uh, cut next week. Small caps up about 2.5% in today's session, and they're up about 4% for the week overall. Such a different tone this week than we saw last week. We thought it might continue on Monday when we saw that sell-off and we saw the warning. So early Earlier in the week from the big banks. But what what changed? What fundamentally changed, Scarlett, between last week, the worst week for the S&P 500, since 2023, that regional banking crisis, and this week where, well, we could be up 4% on the S&P 500. It's not even just what changed from last week. What changed from yesterday to today that there's this shift in odds of people counting mm -hmm. on a 50 basis point cut next week? I mean, looking through it, the argument to go big has always been there, but I'm not clear uh, in understanding why it is that people feel more certain of that today, or at least are willing to put money behind that idea. I know, I know, I know. Nope. Nick, Nick Timrose from the Wall Street Journal, he had the article that sort of raised the issue of 50 basis point cut, and he He's seen as like the journal, the, the Fed whisperer at the journal, and it raises the, the probability for that, and boom, there we go. People are looking for reasons, or that too. All right, well, we got the closing bells uh, here in New York, and it has been a great day. In fact, a great week all, all around uh, with the Dow Jones Industrial Average posting up here about 300 points on the day as we wait for these numbers to settle, but that takes it back up to that 41,400 mark, a seven tenths of a percent gain on the day. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 closing above 5,600, uh, up about 30 points or about a half a percent on a weekly basis. This is the best week the S&P has had all year, best week going back to November of 2023. The Nasdaq up more than 100 points or seven tenths of a percent. And let's get right to it. Carol was just talking about it. The outperformance that we saw by the Russell 2000, a 2.5 percent gain here on the day. You saw similar moves on the S&P mid caps, which closed higher, Carol, by 1.7 percent. Hey, guys, best performing name this week, Broadcom, up 22 percent. Worst performer, Humana, down about 10 percent. And Scarlett, if I look just, though, going back to today, broad-based rally in the S&P 500. Absolutely. Take a look at the IMAP and the sector performances in the S&P 500. That's a lot of green there. And it's the second straight day where we've had just all green across the board. You know, I was looking, if you take a, um, a closer look and split the S&P 500 into two dozen groups, there is a little bit of weakness in a couple of pharma names, but uh, you had to look pretty far down. Is that a brat chart? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. All right. There we go. Yeah, we're done with Brad. No, we're no, not. We're not. We're not. Why are we done with Brad? What happened? Oh, Tim. I'm, I'm I, still I thought up we were done with Brad. Brad. No, it's Brad. No, no. Brad fall. Do you have a case of man today? It's not today? officially <laughs> fall <laughs> yet, so it's still the summer, Tim. <laughs> thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. Okay. I, right. I apologize. It'll never happen again. All right, guys. Uh, to some of the individual gainers, uh, if I may. So let's go to it. Uh, you're looking at RH, formerly Restoration Hardware, as you know, uh, finishing pretty much at its best levels of the day. So a gain of 25 percent, up the most in uh, about four years. Years. Uh, company reported second quarter revenue, profit, all topped Wall Street expectations. You had Citi, Morgan, uh, Jeffries, all raising price targets on it. So quite a run up in that one. Uh, another one among uh, the top gainers in the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, Warner Brothers Discovery uh, finishing two pretty much at its high of the day, up almost 11 percent, continuing and extending a recent climb uh, that after the news uh, yesterday that its multi-year distribution partnership with Charter Communications was renewed early. Keep in mind, it's still down about 26% year to date. Uh, the semi area, SOX, also higher today. One reason why Arm Holding up almost 6% in today's session. Uh, this has Ray, uh, Raymond James initiated coverage on the company with an outperform and a price target of 160 a share. Stock has nearly doubled this year. And I kind of had to throw this in at the end. I'm, I'm guessing you guys have been talking about it. Uh, Trump Media and Technology Group at its highs today up almost 30%, finishing the day with a gain of about 12%. This as Donald Trump came out and said, he doesn't want to sell his shares uh, despite the uh, lockup uh, is set to expire next week. So we saw that one moving around. But we did have, what, a couple trading stops uh, during the day because a bunch of volatility in that name. Okay. Well, on the downside, uh, I want to start with shares of Boeing falling 3.7% percent today. A uh, spate of bad news for the company. Boeing's largest union voted to go on strike. It's 30,000 workers in Seattle walking off. Then 
Just a few hours later, Boeing's credit rating risk being cut to junk, a move that would dramatically increase financing costs of the company. Moody's saying in a statement today, it's reviewing the ratings for a possible downgrade and it will, quote, assess the strike's duration and impact on cash flow and the potential equity capital raising Boeing may undertake to bolster it's yeah. liquidity down 40% and, so far this year. Yeah, and we should just point out, Tim, yeah. uh, on Bloomberg Television, we're actually going to be speaking with the president of the union uh, representing those workers, John Holden. That'll be coming up uh, just a little bit after the top of the hour. Looking forward to that interview. Shares of Adobe also in the red today. Shares sliding by the most since March. The company did issue an outlook that disappointed investors. They're starting to grow impatient to see those new AI tools generate cash. You guys yesterday were talking about that really important metric when we were covering earnings here. It's uh, the digital media net new annual recurring revenue. It tracks the growth of recurring revenue in its creative software business. That came up short of Wall Street estimates. It's going to be $500 million for the period ending in November. Analysts wanted to see $561.1 million. Shares down today by, uh, wow, look at that, more than 8%. Uh, Viasat. Shares of the broadband service providers, including Viasat, tumbled today. United Airlines said it's going to offer free Wi-Fi on its flights through an agreement with SpaceX's Starlink satellite service. Viasat down close to 15% today. All right, taking a look at the bond market. This one's had some nice action in it, particularly in the front end. You had yields down by about six basis points on the two-year. On the 10-year, uh, yields were lower by about two basis points. That spread, though, between twos and tens is now uh, disinverted by about seven basis points, which is a pretty strong week uh, for those two tens. And the question then is, what happens if we don't get that 50, right? Uh, you have Michael Forley, JP Morgan guys, really sticking to that 50 basis point call for next week, although admitting that it might not happen. Uh, and you have City still seeing about 250 basis point cuts maybe in November and then December, guys. All right, so let's get to some of the stories that definitely caught our attention on this Friday. This one was among the most read on the Bloomberg. It has to do with the housing market and the spring selling season. The U.S. housing market had its worst spring selling season in a dozen years. And you guys, we know this story. We've talked about it a lot. A lack of buyers and sellers. Basically, buyers are being priced out uh, because of the expensive, um, on the high prices in terms of housing. And then you have people who don't want to sell because they've got a low mortgage rate, and so they're not putting their house on the market. Does that all change uh, I, over I the don't, next well, that's, that's when I don't know rates. if it does, because it's, you know, as we've talked about for, for years at this point, it's a huge supply issue here. So if rates do go down, what happens to prices? Typically, prices go up of real estate when, when rates go down. Um, we didn't see that play out in the opposite way when rates went up. And that was a huge issue, and that's been a huge issue for affordability. So it remains to be seen whether rates actually uh, affect the housing market. And so many people, too, have those mortgage rates locked in. At such a low rate. Yeah, we do. Do we ever see rates? <laughs> you know, Alex, you know. Keep rubbing it in. <laughs> I do. Um, I will every time I get it. But, yeah. but since She's such never a, moving. That's the thing. So what's it going to take for you to move? It would take like a you know an event Nothing. like what post COVID where we saw rates go pretty much you guys, to zero. Wow, you guys are so lucky. You guys all have houses. Yeah. I just live in a van down by the river. That is Chris totally Farley. a lie. He's going, he's going back to the 90s. I, I hear it's an Airstream with a really nice RH couch. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. For the man flu times. Which I think costs more than And I Airstream. think there's a little yeah. kitty in the corner. Is there not? Scarlett, is there? Mm, I know we have some cat lovers here on the program. Well, I, I don't know about cat lovers. It's been a big week for cats in general, right? Childless cat ladies and also some you know unfounded talk about cats being devoured uh, by people in certain towns. What? Anyway... Um, yeah, that's, that's, now, that's, that's, Wait, that's the cat you chose? No, 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 no. Let's, let's go back to the story <laughs> because Korox. Little kitty. <laughs> little kitty. <laughs> there's, no, there's actually a link to businesses, guys. Clorox had to halt production of some kitty litter. Uh, the Fresh Step litters Not, last what? year. Bleach? Don't put bleach on don't, your cat. Wrong picture. Oh wrong my picture. Gosh. Let's take the picture off and go back to SOS. the cat. Yeah. Wait, explain what What's happened. What's happening here? Explain what okay. happened. Clorox makes kitty litter, the Fresh Step kitty litter, okay. and it had to stop production at factories. Stressing. Because of some <laughs> hacking. And as a result, the cats have moved on. And the cats don't want to go back to the fresh stuff litters. They've moved on to, like, Arm & Hammer's litters. And so Clorox now has to, like, for its growth strategy, it needs to convince cats or cat owners to return to its own litter brand. <laughs> right, so thank you for sorry. being so serious about this. We're so too. sorry to all of you who love ranch dressing <laughs> that that got in there because that was obviously mm. a mistake. Yeah. I guess we don't have enough pictures of fresh steps litter. What about cats? We yeah. love cats. Could we love the cats. They're cute and they're furry and they love you. So, so, so who here owns a cat? Listen. Does your cat like Fresh Step? No, we do. Uh, I was looking up as you saw on my computer. We do world's best cat litter because I used to have three cats. World's best. That's the name of it. And when you have three cats, you need some seriously good litter, people. So we're on that. 
I think we need to go. Beat that. <laughs> All right, you guys. Have a great and safe weekend. Um, on that note, we're going to wrap it. All right, that is our cross-platform coverage. Uh, goodbye to all the cats and dogs that are out there, but do stay safe. That's all I'm going to say. Um, all right, Alex is, uh, I think, heading out. I know Romaine and Scarlett are going to continue on TV, and Tim and I are continuing right here on Bloomberg Business Week. All right, stick with us here on Bloomberg Television. Our coverage continues. We're going to talk about the factors moving the markets this week and some of the recent moves in the healthcare space as Moderna closed lower again today. Also, an update on that strike over at Boeing. A lot to cover here on the close on Bloomberg. This is The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romaine Bostic. A fifth straight day of gains for the S&P 500, giving it its best week, Scarlett, going back to at least November. You saw the moves in the interest rate sensitive sectors there with home builders getting a nice bid on the day. But curiously, another record high for gold. Yeah, we still haven't figured that one out yet. Let's take a look at some individual movers. Uber climbing the most in six weeks after expanding its partnership with Alphabet on driverless ride services. It'll be the sole app offering rides in Waymo, self-driven cars in Austin and Atlanta. And I should mention Boeing, the worst performer in the Dow Industrials. Moody says it's putting the plane maker on review for a possible downgrade to junk status. And of course, this is as 33,000 workers in the Seattle area rejected the latest labor deal and voted to strike. They walked off the job this morning. Yeah, the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers walking off the job here. Uh, kind of a blow here for a new CEO that's really been on the job for uh, less than two months here. Uh, we do talk about that strike and what the effect is on Boeing. And we're going to continue that story right now with the head of their union. We welcome in right now our Bloomberg audiences across all of our platforms. A discussion here about those 33,000 workers walking off the job. We're joined right now by the lead negotiator of those talks on the labor union side, John Holden. He's president of IAM District 751. John, thanks for being here on the day. We were looking at a 20 plus percent pay raise down the line for workers. That was rejected. The original plan or the original proposal that had come out of the labor union side, what was that percentage and do you think you're going to get there? You know, uh, thank you for having me. Um, you know, our members have uh, worked hard over the last 10 years to place themselves in a position of leverage. It's been a long road. Uh, we haven't renegotiated our full contract uh, since 2008, uh, so there's a lot to address. We've certainly, um, you know, had some tough times when our membership was threatened with job loss and and moving jobs away from our production facilities here in Washington, and so there were some pretty deep wounds that our members had to work through. Uh, we proposed over 40 percent wage increases. And, you know, our members certainly deserve those mm -hmm. those wages. Uh, but there's many other things as well. well uh, we also lost our defined benefit pension. There's a mass cost shift on health care. And there's there's many other issues uh, that our members are looking to address. And we're going to work hard to do that. They're confident. Uh, they're ready. They've uh, put themselves in the strongest leverage position possible at the right time. So that's where we're at. What's the relationship right now, like John, with management at Boeing, particularly at the executive side? Do they seem amenable to maybe uh, compromising on some of these issues? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, I know they're going through their own uh, issues, but I will tell you that uh, I'm focused solely on what our members need, what their priorities are, and we need more. And we're going to definitely push that forward. John, uh, we know the White House has been in touch with both Boeing and the union. Is that helpful to you? Have they been able to move the needle in any way? Um, you know, we'll see. That remains to be seen. I hope so. Um, but at this point, you know, we're going to talk with our members. We just are getting our picket lines up and running. It'll be a little chaotic for the first few days here as we get into a well-oiled machine, um, sending a strong message. Our members are united a massive rejection of the contract and a massive vote to go on strike at 96%. So, you know, our members are united across all of our demographics, whether they've worked here for, you know, a few months mm -hmm. or for 45 years, everyone's united. And uh, we intend to go after the items that our members deserve. 
So I, I would like you to be able to outline for us the next steps for you from, from where you sit. Do you plan to uh, head back to the bargaining table this weekend? Uh, FMCS is involved and is uh, calling both sides uh, to come back to the table. So we're working through some of those items. Uh, we will certainly uh, get back to the table as quickly as we can. We also have to talk to our members since uh, the strike was called last night at midnight. We still have some engagement we need to do uh, so that when we go back to the table, we can propose the items that we feel we can um, make headway on to get a deal done. Uh, so we have a little bit of time and, and hopefully early next week. Are, are you in a position, meaning the union, are you in a position right now to provide support for workers should this strike be prolonged? Yeah, we have a very strong strike fund and uh, our members will be eligible for that. There's a lot of opportunity uh, for our members. We've spent the last five years talking about saving for this, you know, putting into your individual strike fund, preparing so that we could stand on principle and make sure that uh, financial decisions aren't what will, you know, make people decide whether they can accept an agreement or not, but standing on principle so that we can all move ourselves forward. I'm wondering if you could go back in time for me, John, to the last contract, the last negotiations, and why you feel now that that maybe came up short. I know that you have the benefit of hindsight of being able to judge what was done then, but what could have been done differently that maybe would have put or maybe made you feel a little bit better about the contract situation today? Well, you know, a lot of this is coming from a, an extension that happened in 2013-14. And in that extension, you know, our members did lose their defined benefit pension. They were threatened that, you know, a major portion of their work would be sent somewhere else for thousands of our members, you know, threatening thousands of their families in our community. We had a massive cost shift on health care, and we also had stagnated wages over the last eight years, eight to 10 years. And that was on the heels of being threatened that the 737 MAX aircraft would also be built somewhere else mm. unless we agreed to an extension and a cost shift of healthcare at the time. So there's there's some deep wounds that we're trying to heal. Right. And, and I believe this agreement, had it been off of you know a previous agreement from three years ago or something, might have been perceived different, but this was just a bridge too far. Right. And our members are fighting for what they deserve um, and there's many issues that we're trying to address. It's yeah. hard to pick just one, but uh, that's what kind of led to uh, this overwhelming uh, vote to strike. Thank you for providing the context there. I understand that the union has uh, requested mediation uh, for the negotiations. How does this process change with a mediator from the NLRB leading the discussions? Does it, I don't know, um, prevent or rule out the chance of a quick resolution the way that we saw uh, at the Boeing Supplier Spirit Aerosystems? Um, well, the, the company reached out to FMCS, Federal Mediation and Conciliatory Services. Um, and so we're, we want to get back to the table as well. That's our job is to reach an agreement that provides a better agreement for our members. Um, I think there are benefits to having mediation and, and hopefully those can work. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't deter us from addressing the needs that our members have set. Um, they have spoken loudly. They are standing shoulder to shoulder, speaking with one voice. And we are determined to make the demands, uh, to make the improvements that they're demanding. So, as you know, Bloomberg Television um, speaks to, or we, we, our audience is uh, analysts, whether it's equity analysts or credit analysts and investors, bond investors and equity investors. What is your message from the union to this audience? What do you want them to know? That's not usually a group of folks that I talk to a lot. So um, kind of the message that I gave the company, I might give to them. Uh, you can either meet the demands of our membership now or it can cost more later. And I think it's important that uh, we resolve this as quickly as we can, that they take seriously our proposals. It's what our members have earned and deserve. And I think that's the best way to resolve this quickly. 
And just real quickly here, too, there's been a lot of talk. Anytime you have these big uh, labor strikes, it's not always just about the workers at that particular company, particularly with an ecosystem like making airplanes here. This is going to have reverberations for other companies, even restaurants and other things in the area here. Uh, have you had any discussions at all with other uh, workers in those lines of work, other business leaders in those areas, small business leaders, about how they're going to get through this should this uh, extend for some period of time? Well, we've had discussions with the, the community in, at large for the last couple of years. In fact, you know, our efforts to fight for job security are fighting for certainly our members to have jobs long into the future, but that also brings jobs for everyone else. The other Boeing employees that aren't represented by the IAM, those in the community that are in the aerospace supply chain that have committed their lives to you know be in aerospace and help aerospace thrive, and, and everyone else that's benefited from you know these good jobs in the community so it's been a it's been a fight not just for ourselves but for everyone else to ensure that we have long-term jobs long into the future john holden president of iam district 751 thank you so much for spending some time with us and explaining your side and of course uh remain it'll be interesting to see how long this lasts because initially when this we knew that this was coming mm -hmm. earlier this week the talk was oh this should be a pretty quick one yeah and it'll be interesting to see who has the upper hand i mean there was a lot of talk uh, about some of the strikes that we saw over the last a couple of years and uh whether it was the labor unions really had the upper hand versus the companies here uh, it seems like you know I mean, that was a good question you asked them about the analyst community obviously you can't respond to that mm -hmm. but most of the analysts and investors we've talked to have said right now Boeing is not really in the best bargaining position. No. As we know, they had a lot of problems even before this. you got a CEO who's only been on the job for a month and a half. Yep. Uh, so it makes you wonder whether maybe uh, Kelly Ortberg decides to try to maybe move this along. Yeah, and, and you know, start with a fresh, um, fresh slate. All right, coming up, we've got Factor Friday. Chris Kane of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us next to talk about factors and which factors uh, were dominant in this past week of trading. This is Bloomberg. Talk about volatility. The S&P 500 ending the week up 4%. This is after it closed down 4.3% the previous week. So let's bring in Chris Kane of Bloomberg Intelligence now for Factor Friday. Chris, uh, you look at factors. What factor has stood out to you over the last two months when it's been pretty volatile, pretty choppy? I just gave an example of the last two weeks, but it's kind of been up and down for a while. Yeah, I mean, the, the very clear story with Factorland is low vol. I mean, low vol factor has been absolutely on fire. So like you said, I mean, the S&P 500 has basically gone nowhere over the last two months. You know, it's been very choppy, very volatile. It went down nearly 10% in early August, came all the way back, went down again 5%, came back. So it's really been flat. But when you look under the hood, it's a very defensive nature. And the low vol factor, uh, long short, is up 12% in that time frame. That is a very big move for in a very short time frame, right? So it means low vol beat high vol by that amount. And even when you look at the sector performance over the last two months, you see that as well. You see things like consumer staples, real estate, utilities really leading the way. So it's really that low vol uh, uh, sections of the market that investors are preferring. Hmm, that's interesting. I wouldn't have. I would have thought there. You'd probably see a little bit more uh, bets on higher volatility. What about the value side of this uh, and how that sort of pairs out in the factor space? Yeah. So value this year, you know, has been back and forth. It's basically flat right now. Meaning long short is, is flat. Meaning cheap and expensive have done roughly the same. That was up about six percent uh, to July. But the, the last two months with all the volatility has really helped things like low vol hurt thing like value. Uh, but the, really the key thing to remember about value is that it makes all the difference how you weight the stocks in your long and short legs. So like if you equally weight the stocks, which is kind of the simplest way to do it, which we usually do, that factor is about flat. If you market cap weight the stocks in your long and short legs, that factor, value factor, is down about 12%. Wow. The real driver there is the short side, right? So very large expensive stocks which you'd be short in a higher size if your market cap weighting it are up t uh, up a huge amount right like nvidia is probably the poster child for that so the stock weighting decisions really are, are affecting the value factor it's not really the value it's really the size that's pretty stunning the difference in performance there um what are the key takeaways for the value factor from a fundamental perspective then it's a mixed picture. It's a really a mixed picture. I mean, one of the things we really uh, focus on a lot is the relative valuations of cheap versus expensive. You know, obviously cheap stocks are cheaper, but it's like how much cheaper. 
in 2018 to 2020, that was like what I call the value winter, where value did very poorly. That was very extreme, meaning cheap was very cheap compared to expensive. That's come back to about averages when you look at price to sales. When you look at price to EBITDA, it's still a little bit extreme, but nothing crazy. Uh, you know, value had profitability on its side for a while, meaning it had higher profitability than expensive stocks. That has switched, mm. which is not a, a positive. But the one positive thing I will say about value is high value stocks right now have a lower beta than expensive stocks. That's pretty rare. You know, typically high value stocks or cheap stocks have a higher beta. That's one of the reasons why that we think there's a value premium is because you're taking more risk. Mm -hmm. But right now it's a lower beta, which we view uh, as, a, as a positive. All right, always an illuminating look at what really moved the markets over the past week. And it'll be interesting to see if and how that changes next week with the big Fed meeting. Chris Kane over at Bloomberg Intelligence joining us as he does almost every Friday for our Factor. Friday. When we come back, we're going to do our next up segment and we're going to be talking tech with the CEO and founder of a company called Formation. Her name is Sophie Navadi and you got to hear her story. That's coming up next right here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. Microsoft is cutting 650 jobs in its latest round of layoffs at its Xbox unit. Last month, Apple reportedly eliminated about 100 jobs in its online services group. So far this year, more than 47,000 workers have been laid off from U.S.-based tech companies. Now, in order to better prepare for their next job, they can turn to services like Formation. It's an AI-powered platform that helps users upskill or reskill. In today's Next Up, where we highlight the entrepreneurs and founders moving the needle for our economy, markets, and technology, we welcome Sophie Navadi. She's CEO and founder of Formation. Sophie, it's always fascinating to hear the backstory, the origin story behind why you came up with this idea. Can you share a little bit briefly about how it is that you as an engineer uh, in Silicon Valley decided to move in this direction? Yeah, Scarlett, thank you so much for having me on today. Um, I am, my name is Sophie Novati and I'm the founder of Formation and um, I'm one of the founders that uh, really knew that uh, I wanted to work on this mission before I knew that I wanted to be a founder. Um, and before Formation, I spent four to five years um, mentoring in various capacities in many different programs. And the key thing that I really noticed uh, about uh, about the engineers that I was mentoring is that they are all different. And as a mentor to all of these different engineers, I found myself giving different pieces of advice to different people, uh, different things to study based on their kind of background, skills, and experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, found that we needed education to be to rethink the way that we're doing education to meet the needs of the diversity of software engineers that are entering the space today. So you're trying to standardize um, some of the uh, teachings, the learnings, the skill sets that you can equip these workers with. Can you talk a little bit about how you determine what kinds of skills um, should be addressed first? Yeah. So. Um, so formation, what we do is we really try to meet the demands of the engineer and bring dynamic mentorship to you based on what you need and your skill levels and, and career goals. And so what the formation journey looks like is very, very different for each person and is unique depending on your incoming skill levels and where you're trying to go. So talk about kind of the build out of this site, Sophie, because we talk about, you know, everyone has an idea and everybody gets yeah. out there. You obviously come from a great pedigree, coming out from some great Silicon Valley companies. And I once read an interesting anecdote about you, how back when you were kind of young and just starting out at Facebook and somehow you ended up in a chess match against Mark Zuckerberg at like, you know, <laughs> two in the morning. I don't yes. know why you're up at two in the morning with Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you got some pretty good lessons there about the scalability of things at a time when yeah. Facebook itself was not profitable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, Formation is designed a lot like uh, some of uh, the feed that you see on, on social platforms. Um, you know, but instead of seeing you know, a feed of primarily social activities, Formation is a ranked feed of learning activities, where you know, a learning activity might be a task to solve a particular problem, or it may be a mentor-led session focusing on a topic that you're really struggling with. And every time you complete a learning activity, the platform gets smarter 
order about what to recommend for you to study next. And uh, every time you complete an activity, your feed adapts to you. And if you're doing really well, you will progress into more advanced topics. And if you're struggling, we will continuously match you to more mentors focusing on the topics that you're struggling with so that you can ultimately get to the next step of your career. And as you get to that next step, oh, those people get to the next step of their career, what becomes the next step for your company? What's next for you? Yeah, well, the uh, technology that we're building is very, it's agnostic to the underlying subject matter that is being taught. So while today we are starting with software engineers, and so far we've placed uh, over 450 software engineers into really prestigious roles in, in the world's top tech companies. Um, but, you know, we're not stopping there. We want to get all 12 million software engineers in the world yeah. on our platform. And, and beyond that, we are also have aspirations to move into other fields as well. Yeah. Are you playing chess with any of those folks and giving them life lessons now? Oh, maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> we'll watch for that. Sophie, quickly here, um, what is the business model? Is this subscription-based or is it like a headhunter where you um, collect fees once you do place someone from the companies? Yeah, so we primarily um, work directly with the consumers, so the, the engineers and the students that are going through the program. Um, we have many different ways to pay for the program. Um, and the most popular way is um, uh, is um, is a pay is an incentive aligned payment model where you know students pay a small fee upfront, and then the uh, remaining fees are based on the salary gain that we're able to to help you help you gain. So far in 2024, we've helped people increase their compensation by over a hundred thousand uh, dollars on average, um, and so uh, the 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 remainder of the fees that you pay are based on the gain that you get, and you pay it after you have started working. Yeah. All right, Sophie, well, this is really fascinating. And for those of us, even later in our careers, we've had to go back and study for things like the CFA, kind of the mashup of adaptive learning with mentorship, uh, certainly something uh, that is novel and unique. And we wish you the best. Sophie Navati there, she's the CEO and founder of Formation. That is our next up segment for this Friday, Scarlett. All right. Um, in terms of how markets have closed the week, uh, we were talking earlier about how it's been a volatile and choppy last couple of months with the S&P 500 moving a lot, but not really going anywhere. This week, we made up for lost ground from last week, right? Um, up half of 1% today, but for the week, up about 4%. Yeah. Uh, you know, reclaiming the 4% drop from the previous week. Yeah, and that 5,600 level, a lot of people have been talking that about that as being a key technical level. Remember, that record high, 5,667, not mm -hmm. to jinx it here, but of course, next week could be a big one. It, yeah, it, it definitely will be a big one. The 10-year yield now, 3.65%. This is The Close on Bloomberg. We're less than 53 days until the U.S. presidential election, and actually, it's even closer than that, as early voting actually begins in Minnesota, South Dakota, and Virginia next week. New data out from nonprofit USA Facts, though, it shows that 78% of adults out there say the spread of misinformation about the government is a major problem, and that could have major implications for what happens on November 5th. Poppy McDonald is president of USA Facts, and she joins us now to discuss those findings. Poppy, we've been talking a lot for the last few years about misinformation out there. We know it matters, and we know it's affected elections. Give us a sense here as to how important it is right now in 2024. Absolutely. Well, you shared that 78% of Americans say misinformation is a major problem. And 39% of Americans told us in the state of facts poll that they have a hard time knowing if what candidates are telling them is the truth. And there is a simple solution. Um, they want to see discussions grounded in facts. And that's why at usafacts.org, we take data straight from the source from government and make it accessible. And if candidates will leverage data um, and get to agreement on what are the facts, I think we can really rebuild trust. 62% of Americans say they want to see mm -hmm. data grounded in facts. But, but let me ask you this, Poppy, because when you say that, I, I mean, I, I want to believe that, but why aren't people sort of, I guess, either seeking out those facts or being fed those facts, or are they just ignoring what's already out there? Appreciate that. So I do have empathy. The facts are hard to get access to. So we go to over 100 data sources um, all from the government, and we make them accessible. And so we are doing things like pulling information from PDFs, 
or downloading the information from an API. And then our team of analysts goes to, through a lot of work to answer Americans' questions with the data that's relevant to things they want to know about, like healthcare, education, and crime. Well, we do see a lot of media outlets trying to do this as well. Uh, ABC, The New York Times, during debates, for instance, they will try to fact check along the way. This doesn't work, though, if people on the left and on the right um, don't agree on the same set of facts. Kellyanne Conway famously coined the phrase alternative facts. Um, how do you think about the source of the data that you're, you're presenting? Because even if it is from the government, there are plenty of people who don't believe the government. Yes, at USA Facts, we do go to the people's data, right? The government data is our data. We are shareholders in this country, and we deserve a right to know how the country is doing by the numbers. And we certainly understand if people think government data could be better, we highly encourage people to advocate for that. And we see issues where government data can be two or three years old. And imagine if you were trying to track the markets mm -hmm. or if you were trying to understand how your business was doing with dated information. So more timely data is certainly an important part of good government data. You guys have put out a whole report on this, and there's some great data in that talking about the need for data. I also want to get something that touches close to home, at least for me and Scarlett here. You talked about how people get their information. What sources of information do they trust? And you, of course, polled them about the media. I was maybe not surprised, but a little discouraged by how low that percentage was of people who trusted the media. We're talking like, you know, 20, 30 percent. It is surprising to see, right? The most used source is social media, and it is one of the least trusted sources. So you do rank above things like social media, like business and AI fall at the bottom in terms of trust. Um, and there is an important way for media to really build that trust. And we would say, go to the facts, right? If we can, uh, certainly uh, Bloomberg and the close is good about leveraging data, um, but if people can turn on um, Fox and MSNBC and hear the same data being used, um, if a candidate running for office and they're the person running against them use the same set of facts, we think it's important that everyone can ground on what are the numbers and then we can have a healthy debate from there about how we move our country forward. Papa, you've been doing this, uh, working at USA Facts since 2018, and it feels like the world has changed completely from 2018 to 2024 now. I'm just curious, from your point of view, what's been the biggest shift in how people trust the data from 2020 just to 2024? Oh, well, the biggest shift that I see is people are increasingly saying that people using different set of facts is the biggest division of this country. Um, so it increased by about 8%, 45% say people using different facts is what's causing political division rather than people just simply disagreeing. So we've seen that continue to move and we think now more than ever having a source like usafacts.org um, and other data-driven sources where people can go just to get the facts about this country so they can make their own decisions about whether yeah. we're headed in right or wrong direction. All right, Poppy McDonald, she's the president of USA Facts, a not-for-profit, nonpartisan civic organization founded by former Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer. All right, when we come back, well, we're going to do something fun here. We're going to take a look back in history in one of the most iconic television shows ever, Law & Order, Scarlett. I'm sure you know it. And here's a question for you before we go to break. Which instrument was to use to make the iconic dun-dun sound that we know huh. about that show. AI. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. The answer when we come back. This is Bloomberg. All right, on this day, September 13th, 1990, one of the most prolific shows on television debuted, Dick Wolf's Law & Order, a standard police procedural that was anything but standard, an hour-long show split into 30-minute halves, one focused on the police investigating the crime, and the second focused on the district attorney who prosecutes the offenders. It was a deliberate split intended to make sure the show could have a life in syndication at a time when reruns were largely bought in 30-minute increments. The idea by Dick Wolf, a former advertising copywriter with a flair for marketing, it was not well received. The Fox network backed out of an initial order for 13 episodes. CBS ordered a pilot but passed on it after seeing it. NBC, though, it ultimately rolled the dice. And on a Thursday night in 1990, the first episode debuted. 
It was called Prescription for Death, and it, like many Law & Order episodes, was ripped from the headlines of a true story involving the medical malpractice death of Libby Zion. But the absolute hallmark of the show has to be that iconic sound, dun-dun, that played as a transition from one scene to the next. And that brings us to our question of the day. Which instrument was used to make that sound? Well, it's a trick question. There was no one instrument. It's a musical composition, thank you for that, that samples, synthesizers, and instruments playing as one, and it's trademarked. A rarity for a sound, and it's the reason why we can't actually play it for you today. Its application for a trademark, which is now owned by NBC Universal, calls it a, quote, strike and a rapid rearticulation of a perfect fifth pitch interval, which in the key of C sounds the notes of C and G struck concurrently. Now, in simple terms, the composer Mike Post, who gets a royalty every time it plays, he joked in an interview back then that the dun-dun sound is actually chung-chung, or as he calls it, ching-ching, because of how much money he's actually made off of it. In fact, only a few dozen, quote, sounds have actually been granted trademark status. The stopwatch from 60 Minutes, the roaring MGM lion, Homer Simpson's doe, and Darth, si Darth Vader's breathing in the Star Wars franchise. Scarlett? We need to think of a way to trademark some of the sounds on our show. I think that's the... And we couldn't play any of them. <laughs> All right. Um, Law & Order has earned a lot of critical acclaim throughout its run. It won six of its 51 Emmy nominations, including a win for Outstanding Drama Series back in 1997. The show is still running, but not a nominee in this year's category. And that tees us up for the 76th Emmy Awards this Sunday. It'll be the second show this year since the 75th show was delayed because of the twin writers and actors' strikes. Joining us now for more is Janice Min, CEO and editor-in-chief of Anchor Media, which covers the entertainment industry with in-depth analysis and reporting. Janice, great to see you. Um, which, nice to see you. Which network, and we're here we're talking broadcaster or streamer, is best positioned for a strong night, do you think? Well, FX, and uh, FX has done kind of the impossible. So if you go way back, FX has been a basic cable channel that has been striving to do prestige television. And remember, there are much bigger spenders in town, Netflix, uh, HBO, and um, little FX, which has been led by this very incredible creative talent executive, uh, an executive named John Landgraf, is coming to the party with uh, Shogun, with The Bear, um, and is looking to have probably its biggest night um, in its history. Yeah, I was obsessed with both of those shows. One thing that struck me, though, for Shogun is that it was nominated um, in the drama category, but originally it was meant to be a limited series. So uh, is this an example of shows kind of gaming the nomination system? Well, anyone who follows awards out here in Hollywood knows that it is it is a game. It is an art. And if you think uh, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are campaigning hard, um, you haven't spent any time <laughs> in Hollywood during award season. There are all sorts of games and tricks that can get played to give you an advantage. And Shogun, uh, yes, it's no longer a limited series. It's a dramatic series. And then, lo and behold, they announced season two of this limited series that was based on one book. <laughs> I, I am curious, Janice. I mean, I, I'm always confused as to how these certain things get nominated and why certain things get a uh, win. I mean, I feel like with the Oscars, I mean, they seem to focus a lot more on the overall quality, if you will. The Emmy seems a little bit different, and not to knock a certain show, but I saw, like, Love is Blind was nominated for this, which is, like, for some <laughs> reason on repeat in my household. And I was like, that's getting an Emmy? I mean... <laughs> So, you know, t television is funny, right? There's a reason that the Oscars have always had a bigger profile. Television has always been a much more populist medium. And um, reality television is part of that. And so there are technical awards. Uh, uh, you can sort of parse these awards into so many different uh, categories that it's no wonder you're covering the spectrum of television. There's even a precursor Emmys, the creative artists yeah. awards that just happened where you because there's so many awards you have to give give them out on another night that isn't televised mm -hmm. so um you know television is as much about rewarding um technical uh -huh. prowess these awards are and uh as they are about sort of the overall just all, it doesn't hurt when you check all the boxes like a shogun or the bear does well I i'm going to ask you a serious question because this kind of this is kind of that disparity, if you will, between, say, A Love is Blind and some of the prestige shows that Scarlet watches, like The Bear and other things here. I, I mean, you know, The Bear is expensive. Shogun is expensive. Love is Blind, I would think, at least on a cost basis, is maybe a little easier 
to make. Uh, are we going to still see uh, these networks commit to these more prestige and more expensive shows? Or are they all just going to go down the route of cheaper reality TV? Well, okay, so can I take you back to almost a year ago when Bob Iger was at Sun Valley um, at the Allen & Company conference and made the comment that television is not core to our business anymore. And where are the Emmys airing tonight? Mm -hmm. Or on Sunday, rather, on his ABC network. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so you can read a lot into that, um, that uh, the, the strikes happen. It's been a rough time in the business. And the fact is, I think the you, a lot of your audience know, knows this statistic that 98 of the 100 most watched shows last year were sports and live events. It's not what you're going to see get awarded on Sunday night. And therefore, you're seeing a lot of spending from the studios and streamers go into live programming, yeah. into sports. And you're seeing Netflix do these stunts and you saw them do a massive deal with the WWE. So we are in an era right now. I don't think it's forever. We're uh, we, the buyers in town don't want prestige, right. but it means that at next year's Emmys and the, certainly the ones in 2026, you'll have fewer bears and show guns. Okay, very quickly, Janice, who would you look for to score an upset on Sunday? I, I, uh, boy, I think Shogun is, is a slam dunk. The bear is a slam dunk. Anytime you see the bear at an awards show, you can just kind of, you know, go to bed early. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the big contests to watch is Meryl Streep is in, yeah. on a television show in Only Murders. And she's going up yeah. um, against Hacks, uh, Hannah Einbender. And uh, that is going to be a real competition yeah. of um, a movie star versus up and coming television star. That one's going to be a big one. We'll yeah. see how Baby Reindeer gets rewarded that night. Yeah. Um, Baby Reindeer had some controversies. People loved it. But it, yeah, it, yeah, it's going to be uh, Baby yeah. Reindeer versus uh, Ripley. I would say, in terms of uh, actor in a limited series. Yeah. And then lots of Oscar winners in the race, Jodie Foster, Brie Larson. Um, and we'll see how that divide shakes out. Yeah. All right, Janice, uh, fun conversation. Of course, we'll all be watching uh, Janice Min. She's the CEO and founder over at Ankler uh, Media here. I, there's only a couple of shows on there that she mentioned that I've actually seen here. So it'll be interesting to see who wins. We're not going to win, apparently. We're not going to be the upset. Yeah, no, yeah. I, we weren't nominated, unfortunately. All right, we got to wrap things up here. Uh, let's set you up real quickly for some of the big market moving events over the next week. We get oral arguments in that case in TikTok, that TikTok ban that's supposed to take place in Jan January. All right. And we also have Empire Manufacturing, but these are like secondary tertiary data points before the big one. Tuesday, of course, we get retail sales and industrial production as well as some earnings. Earnings season still going on? Yeah, General Mills, a read on the consumer, maybe, or consumer staples. Of course, Wednesday, that's going to be the big day, Scarlett. Yeah, 2 p.m. is when the Fed decision comes out. It's expected to cut rates. The question is by how much, 25 or 50 basis points. That uh, The odds of that change day to day, and I'm sure it'll change again in the week, uh, in the days to come. And then at 2.30, Jay Powell speaks to the press. And it's not the only uh, big rate decision that week. We're also going to hear from the Bank of England on Thursday. Yeah. Bank of England, of course, moving on its own, it's got its own concerns. And then that follows, uh, of course, uh, the ECB cutting its rates earlier mm -hmm. this week. And of course, we also have the BOJ as well. Yeah, absolutely. And don't forget as well, some additional earnings. I know you love it, Darden, as well. And then this is this struck me. I didn't know this. Did you know early voting begins for the U.S. elections next week? I, I mean, I thought the campaign just got started. Yeah, so three, at least three states already start uh, uh, the voting process there. So a lot to cover next week. And we do hope you join us in. As far as politics, if you want to learn about that, early voting. Stick around. Balance of Power is up next.